It's Sunday, February 5, 2023. Welcome to the 50th episode of The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. Please also subscribe to my 5-Minute News daily briefing podcast on iTunes or wherever you get yours. Joining us today is founder and publisher of Courier Newsroom, a network of progressive local newsrooms in eight states across the country. Tara McGowan, welcome to The Weekend Show. Thank you so much for having me, Anthony. It's a great privilege to be on your 50th show. Congratulations. Know, right? It's kind of, a, kind of a special thing. I should, if I'd have known in advance, I would put some flags up or something. Um, we have something in common in as much as we've both kind of set up uh, news organizations to fill a, a gap in the market. Uh, you know, I started 5-Minute News just as a little podcast because I was like, wow, where are people like getting real non-biased or unbiased non-partisan news from? Um, tell us a little bit about your organization and, and how it came to fruition. Sure. Um, and I, I'm sure that we we came at this about very similar ways and for similar reasons. But I started Courier Newsroom in 2019. Um, I, I was a former journalist and then I spent uh, a good number of years in progressive politics and advocacy work running digital programs and um, there were a few different layers to why, uh, sort of layered reasons as to why I started Courier. Uh, one of them was I spent about 10 years running um, massive multi-million dollar political advertising campaigns uh, to support progressive causes and candidates online, on social media and on the internet. Um, and I, I, I was very close to the strategic playbook on the left for communicating to voters um, and was very frustrated by how uh, political electoral cycle driven investments and communications were, whereas the other side had built their own media infrastructure that they um, more often than not used to spread lies and disinformation. Um, and uh, of course, we have a mainstream media that lives in a defensive posture about being called liberal or having a liberal bias. So instead, they 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 present false equivalencies between facts and lies all the time. And so uh, Democrats and progressives were leaning entirely on short term advertising on television and the Internet and snail mail uh, to get their message across and increasingly to just get the facts across to different groups of voters and citizens. And so I felt that there was a very glaring gap in the media infrastructure and that there needed to be more explicitly, transparently progressive news um, that could be built in the vein of our values. We would never compromise truth. Uh, we fact check everything. And yet um, we have to be able to communicate our values and what we stand for and our accomplishments to people because no one else is going to if we don't. Um, and the right really does understand that. And I think they weaponize that in ways that are immoral and unethical. Um, and not ways certainly we ever would at Courier Newsroom and don't. Um, but there is no, there is a very long standing history of uh, partisan and ideological and advocacy driven media here and abroad. I don't think there's anything nefarious about that. I think what is dangerous is when it is abused or weaponized and, and truth and facts and integrity and morals and ethics are not upheld. So um, I built Courier to be uh, in line with our values and to um, also reach people and try to um, increase their uh, awareness and, and agency about how they can become empowered and informed and active citizens in our democracy at a time when we need it so much. So that was the genesis for it. Um, our audience is very specific, and I'm sure very similar to you because I uh, your podcast is similar to our approach to content in the way that you need to meet people where they are. Uh, for you, right, that was audio and increasingly video. Um, we do a lot of that too, but also um, the way that they consume information. We have no attention spans any longer. <laughs> and um, well, that's why mine's called Five Minute exactly. News. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and that's, at, that's the whole reason. That's exactly right. And at Courier, our newsrooms, our reporters produce very digestible video, visual, and skimmable copy written content. So um, our audience are passive news consumers, which is most Americans. They don't read long articles. In fact, they don't go to websites often. They don't leave their social media news feeds. So how do you get good factual and progressive information across in a way that they will actually absorb it? And so um, we, I really think that we are setting new precedents in local news in particular, which has been very slow to evolve to the, the decentralized and very online media environment we live in today. 
I want to talk about this kind of crossing the Rubicon of, of truth and and how it is possible, because it's kind of an elephant in the room, right? To say it's a progressive news organi- organization, but it's also purporting to tell the truth. Now, in, in modern America, people would say that the truth is, well, that's your truth, or that's your truth on that side or on that side. And, and where I come from in the UK, you know, I grew up learning how to do the news, and it, it has to be truthful because it's regulated, you know, government regulated, and the mm-hmm. organization will lose its license to broadcast if it isn't telling the truth. And Americans don't understand that. Like, well, if the government's regulating it and it's a Labour government or a Conservative government, then sh- and it's like, no, this, you know, journalism exists outside of government. And that's why I would argue that, you know, things like Fox are not journalism. They are entertainment. And mm-hmm. but they just sit on the EPG in the kind of news section. And, and that is kind of confusing. And let's just use an, an example and that is that on Friday there was an announcement about the uh, the, the jobs numbers, 517,000 new jobs added in January. Economy is looking pretty strong, although the Fed keep it raising interest rates, which is not a, not a great idea, but, you know, we'll come to that. But all the news organizations were reporting this great news for the U.S., the fact that, that the economy is stronger than it's ever been. Uh, this jobs number has not been seen for like 40 years. This is, this is you know, un- unprecedented. And yet, right-wing media, Fox, Newsmax, One America, and I guess all of the talk channels, and of course the printed publications, won't mention it. They don't mention it. They talk about a fear of recession. They try and twist it so that, you know, Biden's doing a bad job. Who does this serve? You know, it doesn't benefit anybody. It makes... 70 million Trump voters who might be watching Fox at one point or another think that they're living in a country that is sinking, that is a disaster, when in fact, things are pretty good, right? Yeah, well, I think uh, the issue is that I believe right wing media outlets like Fox News do believe it benefits them to hide the truth about uh, the economy and how well it is going right now under the Biden administration and Democrats and a handful of Republicans who voted for the infrastructure bill that is creating enormous amounts of jobs and will will promote economic prosperity in states across the country. Um, but the right wing media uh, does have an agenda, and that agenda is to do anything and everything they can to make Democrats look bad in the interest of building political power. Um, and they've been quite successful at that over the past number of decades in certain respects. And they are, um, you know, they're coming up from behind right now a little bit. They didn't do as well as they certainly hoped or as history might suggest in the midterms. Um, but this is this is where um, we have such a crisis when it comes to information in America today because we don't have regulated media <laughs> in large part. And um, and it is. Uh, it, it, Fox has presented itself as news, like their tagline, my entire life has been fair and balanced. It's a joke, right? It's a parody um, because they aren't fair. They aren't balanced and they aren't honest um, more often than not. And so um, they are pursuing a political agenda. And uh, and so, you know, we saw the same thing with January 6th hearings. They were all over the national media in America on every cable news and and local news station outside of Fox News. It was practically. But how do we? How how do you, with a with a, you know, a progressive a news organization and me with a with a with an unbiased kind of fact based news channel, how do we reach Republicans who were otherwise watching these channels? Because. You know, part of the problem with U.S. media is it's preaching to the converted. And people are very good at, you know, joining the Klan, whether it be on the left or the right. And you could call them cults or you could call them, uh, well, as Fox News do, they refer to them as each other as the family, as I discovered on this show uh, last week. So just ex- just explain to me about what efforts you have gone to to reach the people that otherwise would be falling foul of misinformation. Sure. So at Courier, we made a very explicit decision to not try to meet what I refer to as the Kool-Aid drinkers on the right. And those are the folks that, you know, they have Fox News playing in their house 24-7. I know folks like this. I have friends whose relatives and parents, they have lost to the foxhole. 
as we call it, um, they are, in my opinion, too far gone with uh, with the exception of de-radicalization strategies and tactics and outreach that are far above my pay grade or understanding or expertise level. Um, I believe that you've had on the author of The Cult of Trump. I really do believe that um, there are a lot of people that have been lost uh, to the cult-like sort of um, uh, uh, tribalizing um, approach and frankly successful approach that that outlets like Fox News have taken. Um, that said, Fox News, Tucker Carlson on his best night has a couple million viewers. Uh, this country is nearing 400 million in terms of population. So um, while they do seem to have an outsized impact sometimes on the national discourse and political debate, it's often because the mainstream media is taking their bait and turning um, manufactured stories and controversies into national news. And so that's one challenge. So what we chose to do at Courier was actually focus on the tens of millions of Americans who don't watch Fox News, who don't watch MSNBC or CNN, who are getting their news and information online, and who share our values, which are popular values. They have been labeled as progressive or even socialist by the right, but um, you know, desire for uh, meaningful gun control, uh, action on climate change, abortion access in this country. These are things that over 70% of the American population want and are not being represented by over 70% of our elected officials. And um, it's not even being mentioned on MSNBC. I mean, they don't talk about the the kind of the, the, the popular thinking, because I always refer to the US as a very progressive country, because I believe the people are, but the represent, re- representatives aren't. And, and, I, and I said this a couple of weeks ago, talking about gun control, you know, there is zero appetite from elected representatives on the right to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you were to survey the wider population, everybody knows that school shootings are bad, more gun sales are the cause of that. So I'm really interested in how we reach people rather than this. It's almost like there's a whole fake parallel universe going on that is American media, that that has no bearing on reality. And there are people staying home, scared to leave the house, because the news is telling them that, you know, there's a balloon in the sky, and it's taking photographs of you. That's that's right. Um, I don't know if you want to go down this rabbit hole, but I certainly can about what I think are the really, really uh, misaligned business incentives and interests of media companies. We live in a disinformation economy. We live in economy that preys on people's emotions and what is going to trigger their emotions to drive more clicks and engagement, right? It plays to our worst sides as humans and human psychology, right? The interest in conspiracy theories and salacious content or celebrity gossip or drama, right? These things kind of play at our uh, kind of worst sides yeah. in certain ways. And it's but, all revenue. Let's be clear. So everything you just mentioned is just cash dollars. Every emotion that we have can be encapsulated by Facebook or captured by YouTube or whatever to create revenue. All of these problems to me, all of these crises at a national level, but also a global level, it always stems to me from unregulated capitalism. And right. I, I I really do think that, like, I, I believe in capitalism. Um, I think, though, that the way that it needs to function for the best of us and for the best of our ideals in America is if it is regulated, right? Yeah. Um, the Republican Party, today's Republican Party, does not believe in any regulation. They do not believe in any government intervention when it comes down to it, unless they are controlling the government and choose what they want to uh, to do with that power. And they've even um, used the word deregulation as a good thing, right? So, so that word has been weaponized, you know, smaller government deregulation. And the reality of that is, is that you end up with, with companies putting goodness only knows what into the water system, right? That's right. Well, and that's what they've also done is they've equated uh, deregulation with pro-business, so yeah. people choose, right? Oh, I'm pro business, so I am for deregulation. Where actually we should have, like, right, a pro business, pro worker economy um, that is for regulation, because regulation is how we are going to ensure more fairness, more e- equity, more accountability, and frankly, more progress. 
um, for a more prosperous nation that that helps everybody have equal access to opportunity. And so that's another issue. And again, it, it kind of comes back to the right being operating at a much higher level of narrative intervention than the left in America often does. The left is focused on policy and solutions and communicating those things. Is and, not and detail. Right. And detail. Yeah. And good governance, <laughs> making yeah. sure government does things and delivers for people. And I am not saying the Democratic Party is perfect by any means in this country. I have a number of criticisms about it. But I will say just looking at the Biden administration and Democrats in Congress and the Senate over the past two years, they have accomplished historic, unbelievably significant pieces of legislation they have passed that are going to have tremendous implications and already are, are on, on our economy on public health care, on climate change uh, mitigation. And so I, I just I think that, you know, oftentimes when you have your head down doing the work, sometimes you forget to tell the right story about that. And when the other side has absolutely no interest in accomplishing anything for the majority of people, they spend a lot of time thinking about how to craft a story that's going to get people to vote in their direction based entirely on fiction. And all of the good stuff, whether it be the jobs numbers announced on Friday or whether it be, you know, the, the economy being buoyant, um, the country being safe. You know, there are things that obviously people are doing on, 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 a, on the ground level. Everybody is trying to do their best, but they're doing their best and, and civil servants are doing their best for the entire populace. This is, I guess, what, you know, when you when you politicize everything, you forget that a firefighter has to do the same for a Republican who's burning in a building as a Democrat burning in a building. And, and, and that message doesn't seem to be communicated, in my view, enough to the, the, the public, you know, through the news or even through, let's say, the podium in the White House press room. You know, why is there, why is it like one rule for one side and one rule for another side? And, and, and we've seen this this week. If I could just quickly, sorry to talk yeah. so much, but to mention no, this story that uh, has been kind of making the headlines this week about uh, Ilan Omar and uh, the House of Representative Republicans on Thursday, I think it was, they ousted her from the high-profile committee over remarks widely condemned as anti-Semitic that she apologized for uh, two years after Democrats removed two Republicans from committee assignments for being extremists. I mean, this story is another example of how it's like one rule for one side and another rule for the other. And the media should be doing a better job of exposing that and saying this is not true or this is the detail of this subject. And and Joe Biden should be doing it and, and Corinne Jean-Pierre should be doing it. And I'm not hearing it. And that's only making people more scared and more angry and, and more divided. I it, You're touching on such a good... Point and such an issue that uh, I, I don't know that I have an answer on how to resolve. But, you know, there is this understanding and communications. And I think I've seen this out of the Biden administration quite a bit where, um, you know, there is an interest in not providing more oxygen to a story that, yeah. you know, you don't trust the reporters are going to get right either way because of how they cover these things. And so they don't want to spend more time giving it more attention when there are bigger things to talk about, including economic policies and policies that are going to help people and achievements that are now coming to fruition in communities across the country. So I think that's one piece of it, that you're not, you know, getting the like, like the, the constant punching back and debunking of this stuff, because sometimes it just feels like it's actually going to be more effective and strategic to talk about the things you want to talk about. But where that falls apart is when you do have massive networks and, and channels and properties on the right that they're going to drum that beat or they're going to beat that drum for their um, audiences and their supporters every day. And there isn't a counter narrative that reaches them. So that kind of gets back to your earlier question about how do we reach people with other information than the right wing media? And you have to be you have to understand if you are in the business of news or media today that you don't build something and people come. There is a very, very tiny percentage of this population that actually proactively looks for and consumes good news and information every day. Yeah. You have to go to these audiences. And when you do, which we've done enormous amounts of testing and learning at Courier and my previous organization acronym, when you inject 
factual news and headlines, whether it's from the New York Times, which they might hate if they were asked on a survey, or the Wall Street Journal, or any of our news outlets, when you put that into their news feeds through targeting or other strategies, they are informed by it. They're just not going to go look for it. And there isn't even really a media criticism of where it came from, which is how we are in this mess to begin with, with disinformation. So in a lot of ways, it's a share of voice challenge. And that's we think about this all the time and put this into operation all the time at Courier, where it's we really believe in Steve Bannon's very effective strategy of flood the zone, because when they are the only ones flooding the zone, that is the only information that reaches people. And it has a downstream and ripple effect beyond their core audiences. And there is not enough good information that is intentionally reaching these populations who are not going to pay the New York Times paywall who are not going to listen to NPR every day in their community, where you actually have to go to them and put that information in front of them and make it relevant to them. That's the other problem in our in our national media today, too, is political reporting is very much reported for and to and by elites. It's yeah. just a fact. They are increasingly out of touch with how most Americans live their lives and think about these issues. Um, I, I heard, I, I believe it was my attorney general in Rhode Island on NPR this morning giving an interview where he was talking about messaging related to um, the economy. And it's like a lot of people are not hearing about jobs numbers and equating that to their lives. They want to know how and where they're going to get a job. And that's how we think about it. A courier is talk about interview the people who have gotten a job right from the, these economic grants and these infrastructure um, uh, grants and projects that are coming online and and then back into how this came to be and who's responsible for it and what that debate is. Don't leave this. With this the- goes back to the very nature of public service. What is public service and, and public service broadcasting or public service media, I guess, in the U.S. is kind of fallen foul of of donors and of sponsorships you know because they need to run and they need to and 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 you need to pay people properly as well that's the other thing and and you know i i started doing five minute news as a passion project and i continue to but i'm struggling to like how do i monetize this because i don't want to take money from organizations because you know even if you try and choose a sponsor that on the face of it seems like it's entirely legitimate you then find out that they're using child labor in indonesia to pay for their you know to to make their products and you're like well I, i just can't do that so i would rather not be sponsored in fact i'm in the process of setting up a, a patreon because and that really seems to be the best way to monetize independent journalism and and the type of stuff that you and i are doing where you actually reach out to the your very readers or viewers or customers and you say look if you want to see this and if you believe that this is of use to you then please support it it that's right but then the conundrum there anthony is then you're only giving information who proactively want that information right yeah. we it, but you're still so, doing the information you know you're still putting it out there absolutely and, and not everybody has to subscribe not everybody that's has to right. support i you. was going to say you can't you can't gate all of it because then it just yeah. it contributes to the information divide and gap um, yeah. Because we don't have that cultural awareness or um, entrenched belief yet in this country, because information has always been widely free and continues to be on the Internet and social media, yeah. that there is not this tradition of paying for good information. And I do think that there's a lot of good things happening in the journalism and sort of saving journalism space in America, where it is how can we subsidize? So inform- good information is free and accessible to populations who won't pay for it by the people who do understand the value and will pay for it. But I also think it comes down to just a transition in the industry where we need to rely more on philanthropy. And that is not a bad thing, as long as we continue to uphold transparency, which is really important of who backs you and what those you know firewalls or those things you have in place are between the people, your corporate sponsors or your individual philanthropic billionaires. I mean, Courier, we are transparent about our investors. I have two billionaires that gave me the investment and are on my cap table to make this a reality without an interest in a financial return because they believe in the good work that we're doing. And so that is a shift. Um, and, and I think it's an important one because if you have to make money 
off of your good information, you inevitably are going to start limiting who is reached by it or yeah. um, be beholden to different interests. It's just the reality. And so I really do believe in this movement of nonprofit philanthropically funded journalism. There's also efforts to lo lobby for government funding um, to support local news in the fourth estate, which I think is really important and long overdue in this country. And I know that it is a controversial topic um, and a fraught decision. But I do think that the UK and other countries have shown a model of where this is successful and creates really good media that can still hold and should because it is their responsibility, the government accountable, regardless of who's in power. Let's talk about Newsmax, because there's been a whole lot of uh, noise about this in the last uh, few days. C complaints from the right that AT&T, who uh, own DirecTV, Though they have a 70% share of DirecTV. They've dumped Newsmax. Um, they're saying because it's, it doesn't have enough viewers and it's, you know, they can't afford the fees and all this kind of stuff. But what I found most interesting about this was the reaction from people on the right who were making claims about Newsmax, saying, you know, this is, we need people to have the facts. We need people to be able to have direct access. And in fact, one person, it might have been Ted Cruz, I think, said, you know, or even Kevin McCarthy said something along the lines of, you know, people need to know exactly what the Republican Party are up to. And it's like, wow, you are literally admitting that this news channel is a mouthpiece for your political party. You know, it, they are as blatant and as open about it as that. Now, I, I've watched Newsmax and I watch all of these right wing channels and, and I'm aghast gen genuinely because they serve... Nobody, as we've said, you know, the, the, the fear mongering and the bad news and Hunter Biden's laptop and all this stuff. It's like there's a whole lovely life that you can live if you live in reality. You know, there's a really, you know, we, this is a beautiful country. It has some of the most incredible landscape, has some of the greatest people. You really can prosper. You know, the economy of this country is such that if you have a good idea and you go out and set up a business, I don't know, cleaning windows or selling ice cream, you will likely succeed because there are enough customers to, to serve. And it's not like that where I come from. You know, we, we, we have poverty wages and we live under austerity in the UK and it's, it's pretty depressing. But the US is not like that. And I just wish that these channels that claim to be patriotic and uh, for freedom and all of these words that have been weaponized by the right actually kind of walked the walk and talked the talk because all I see is them talking down the country. And that is why AT&T should take them off their, their channels, surely. Absolutely. I, I I was smirking and giggling inside in my head at the beginning of, of you explaining this story because there's, there's also such extraordinary hypocrisy in their <laughs> argument about this because... Yeah. The company that has decided to drop Newsmax is a private corporation in right. America that can make those decisions back to our, 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 you know, conversation about capitalism and unregulated capitalism. Like they, you know, are crying a foul about a corporation making this decision to drop it, which is absolutely their, you know. Well, they did the same about Twitter when they banned Donald yeah, Trump, right? Absolutely. And, and, and these are all private entities. And yet there is this kind of weird blurred line between what is, you know, public and in the public interest and public, and, and then just a private company who happens to have a social media site. Right. That's exactly right. And so they, they, you know, they pick and choose based on their own interests. They want Newsmax to exist because Newsmax is an important weapon for them that continues to feed people this junk and these lies and this very negative portrayal that is often based in lies and fiction of our country because they are trying to bring them along into their movement to bring the systems that currently exist down. It is a very strategic um, operation to build media like Newsmax and to paint the country and government and Democrats in a very specific light um, to build support for alternatives that they present that are often also lies. And I, I just think that we can't lose sight of that because they have done the, the, the conservative movement in America. Um, and, you know, now we have different breeds of it. MAGA Republicans are not like the Republicans I grew up with when I was a child. Certainly those look really good now in retrospect to our Republican Party today. But they they have run a very successful multi-decade year effort to decrease trust in government, to sow mistrust in government in America. 
And this is out of a fascism playbook. When people no longer trust government or institutions, they do not see them as effective. They do not see them as representative of them. They, they hear about no good, only bad and corruption, right? They start to really trust the people that are feeding them that information every day. Those people become very powerful and they become the ones who are turned to for the alternative or the solution. This is what Trump did. This is what Republicans have done in America my entire life. And so they really benefit from making people believe that the government does nothing good for them. And that and 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 that is something that we again our newsrooms we pride ourselves in talking about the good that government and elected officials do when they do good. It doesn't mean that you don't talk about the corruption where it exists. But if we're never talking about the good things the government does, your point about the job numbers, etc., and we're not doing it in a way that is relevant to Americans, those narratives will always drown out any economic policy conversations or job number reports because it's a better, more entertaining story, what they are telling. And so, and it plays to people's own insecurities and fears and frankly, their lived experiences of not feeling represented. So they weaponize this and, and they weaponize populism um, in a lot of ways in order to advance their own agenda and to build power that they will use to only benefit the very wealthy few in this country. The free press is, is baked into democracy. The, 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 they are connected. You need a free press to bring balance to a democracy. Now, as we know, Trump branded the press the enemy of the people and fake and all of this stuff, which is more damaging than a lot of the stuff he said, in, in my view, because, you know, the free press represents everybody. And, you know, this is a problem, isn't it? The idea that democracy, as you have just described it, is there isn't really an appetite for democracy anymore on the right, not just with the elected representatives, but actually with the, the people that are following them. The, the, they've started to be brainwashed, because I've actually seen it in the last few years, and I suppose the insurrection was really the kind of, you know, the, the, very much the, the pinnacle of that, was that, well, why do we need the IRS? What, why do we need the FBI? Why, why do we need NATO? Why do we need any of these organizations that keep us safe? I mean, this is really dangerous, Tara. Incredibly dangerous. And it is I, like I get this feeling in my stomach when the conversation comes to this level, because it is a very difficult thing to solve that is not going to be solved quickly, even if there was the will and the resources to do it. And that is the lack of civic education in this country and how civic education has been gutted and continues to be gutted. And now we're seeing it in an even more dangerous respect where Republican governors and state legislators are, are banning books, banning African-American history, as Ron DeSantis has done from the Florida public school system, literally erasing history, erasing true history, and not providing civic education about how government works, why government exists, why it's important, the difference between democracies and democratic states and non-democratic states, how privileged we are to live in a democracy in this country for as long as we have it. And my God, I hope we keep it. Um, but it is it, that is in question today. Um, and certainly over the next few years, I think 2024 is, is the, actually the most consequential election since 2020, because I, I don't believe that we have uh, gotten out of this position of being up against people who really do want to tear down our democracy. Mm. Um, and they don't have a plan for what they would replace it for, by the way. That always is the part that I'm like, yeah, okay, there, are no and then there are literally no and policies other than 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 and create chaos and burn it to the ground. I mean, Carrie Lake is a good example of this, yeah. right? Where, where, where the, you know, she is walking around telling people that she is the, the governor. I mean, as far as she's concerned, she won. And she's doing these like mini rallies in tents with a, enough people to make it look like she's got a following. And she claims that what she is doing is true democracy. And people are buying into it and they're giving her money. They, well, and that's the only reason she's doing it right now, because she knows she's not winning. The institutions have actually done their job. They have upheld our democracy, right? Our our uh, our elections are sound. Um, we've had some of the most safe and secure elections of my lifetime over the past few years. And so this narrative that is based in absolutely zero facts that they continue to peddle on the right is because it really ramps people up. It gets them to give money. It makes them feel represented because they have been told their whole lives that government is 
is corrupt and 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 that elected officials lie. And and so I, I think about this with the insurrection too, the siege on the Capitol. All those people that spent money and time and took time off of their jobs to go to to stage a violent attack on our capital to put Trump back in office when he was not elected. What did they think came next? Yeah. Like, I mean, they would they would never vote again. They would Trump would be, you know, God of, of America forever. I don't know that they get past the you know what they are being asked to do in real time and certainly uh, i think that is really dangerous because i do believe that there is a level of brainwashing and there is just a lack of of media literacy there's a lack of civic education and literacy there's a lack of historic like history um, and context that's provided to people and we have to solve that and it starts in schools and that is why we are seeing the biggest attack on our public schools um, certainly of my lifetime right now in America, playing out in states all across this country, because they know that's how they start the indoctrination very young. I do want to talk about education. I just have one more thing to say about Carrie Lake and, and that kind of movement. And that is that how is it possible that you can have this this kind of hypocrisy where you're like the you know elections are fraud, they're fake, don't trust them. There's Hugo Chavez is meddling with the voting machines. And then in the next breath, say, vote for me, vote for me. You've got to vote for me. Please vote for me. It just you you have to be a, a, a whole new brand of stupid, right, to kind of see how those two things can work in parallel. I mean, does that mean that democracy will save America ultimately because fewer people will probably vote on the right because they don't trust the system? And then you'll just have more carry lakes claiming election fraud, and then it'll end up in the courts and it'll be proven that actually it was one of the safest elections in history. I mean, how, how many votes is it going to take? Because at this rate, Republicans will keep losing. I, well, I, I had, I think, somewhat maybe of a, a naive thought on this after the midterm elections, where I thought maybe Republicans would really take to heart the lesson that it is a bad strategy to to tell <laughs> your voters and your supporters that the elections are fraudulent and that your vote won't matter um, yeah. because they lost a lot of races they should have won, probably, uh, yeah. uh, based on the current information ecosystem that exists. And, and they didn't. And, and I think that you make a good point there. Uh, and then, however, we saw Kevin McCarthy let actual insurrectionists and, in my opinion, traitors of this country onto committees and to negotiate with him in order for him to get the speakership. And so all of my hope that they would have learned any lessons about the dangers of, of these kind of communications that actually would prevent them went out the window because they're they are willing to give up the entire ship. Um, to be able to have this uh, this power, and it is it's really really alarming and very scary because this is the most extremist uh, Republican Party um, that I've ever seen, and they are now running the committees in the House agenda. And thank goodness that we that Democrats maintained the Senate because you know a lot of these measures won't come to bear because the Senate won't put them up for a vote or, or pass them. And yet they are going to continue to provide the media all of this chum of, of gossip and, and conspiracy theories and all of these things because the, the press is, you know, responsible for covering them, but it's going to turn into these narratives that really hurt Democrats and hurt Americans because they are going to drown out all of the good factual information and things that government is doing on behalf of the American people to be able to set the narrative for 2024, which, again, is an incredibly consequential presidential election here. That deal that McCarthy did, I mean, just the visuals of seeing him like almost pick a fight with Matt Gates in the in the chamber, you know, kind of goes up to him and people having to hold them back. And I mean, I was like, I couldn't believe what I was seeing, Tara. But this deal... And you couldn't also probably, tear away, well, right, Anthony? <laughs> Yeah, of course. The sensationalism, I was I was drawn to it. You know, I was I was watching it on C SPAN, so I know no network was earning money out of me necessarily. But I would say that the deal that got Kevin McCarthy the speakership involved getting rid of Adam Schiff, getting rid of AOC, getting rid of Ilan Omar. Eric Swalwell. Eric Swalwell. Like that was the deal. 
And to me, and what they were saying on Thursday, which I thought was most interesting, was this is an attack on minorities. It's an attack on women of color. It, it goes back to that kind of the, the, the racism that is so baked into the Republican Party. And I don't really know the solution to this because, you know, as I said earlier, it's one rule for one and another rule for the other. But at the end of the day, if you don't have Ilan Omar on the committee where she was doing really good work with all of her experience as a Somalian refugee, you know, and, and you, we need that. You know, that is what the word representative does. It represents the type of population that are now living in the United States. And it's a great disservice to America to do these kind of short-term political games just so that Kevin McCarthy can put on his resume that he was once the speaker for 15 minutes. Well, that's right. Well, and that's exactly what it is, is these are games and they're games yeah. that have massive impl implications on people's lives in this country because they're, they're the goal of, of removing these individuals from the committees is to get some quick wins to the people that he Kevin McCarthy negotiated with, but also to the MAGA base in this country who don't understand probably what committees do. I, I, I mean, I mean that generally, right? Like they're not actually talking about the work of the committees. They're just talking about like quick, you know, quick scores on the board, like where they're like, look, we got rid of these people that represent these things that we all hate and we've trained you to hate. And so it feels like a victory. It feels like they're like using their power against, you know, wokeism or all of these things. And then it has real implications. And so it goes back to the fact that Republicans are not trying to gain power to actually run a functional government that serves the American people. And I do believe, and I am a deeply optimistic person, I have to be to do this work, you have to be, to keep believing in democracy in this country, that, that, that the American people, when they do, they continue to see the chaos that Republicans bring when they're in power and the results that Democrats bring when they're in power, I think that's why so many Democrats won that maybe shouldn't have or wouldn't have in past midterm election cycles, because I think Republicans have gone too far and they are making a mockery of themselves in this process. And again, it's a, very, a, it's a really good point. It's because it's almost like the circus has now come to town. Yes. And, if, and this is very much an example of how the Republicans would run the country if they had control of all three branches of government in 2024. Because, you know, George Santos, I don't really like to talk about him because I think he's a bit of a flash in the pan and he'll be gone in a, in a few weeks, you know, erased, erased from history. But he is an example of how low the Republican Party will, will stoop to get, to get a win. A guy who just makes everything up, has a kind of false identity and, you know, who has supposedly got two brand new knees. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and it is entertaining still, right? But this right. is good that they're, that, that honestly, there is more attention being placed on people like George Santos and Marjorie or Taylor Greene, because when they speak, I, I do believe that the vast majority of Americans, if they hear them, are not going to be on that side. Do not believe yeah. that those are people that should be representing them. And so yeah. it is. They are. They now have power. What they do with it, as long as as organizations like yours and Courier and hopefully some large media institutions that see this, remind the American people and and tell the story of what they are doing with their power. Because I, I really, you know, and, and I think it's the same thing with the, you know, the, the, the lack of trust now in the Supreme Court in this country, as they've become a political, ideologically run court on the, on the right. And so I, I, I believe that the Dobbs decision actually changed the political dynamics of this country, as long as people continue to be reminded that it's no longer the threat to your rights, they are starting to take away our rights our rights to our bodily autonomy, our rights uh, to to a safe environment for our kids at their schools, a, a right to go to a concert or a grocery store and not be shot and killed. These are things that like we need to protect and continue to fight for. And it comes back to our general thesis of this conversation, which is communicating this information and communicating what they are not doing with their power when they're talking about things that don't affect the vast majority of people and how those things are actually going to get done. And their agency in it. People need to be reminded that they have enormous amounts of agency in their vote and in their public service and their citizenship.
because that is democracy, which is what something... I mean, I don't even hear Republican or Republican representatives using the word democracy. And I've said this before, and, and I don't really make a big thing of it, but I think there's more to it than just semantics. But the word democracy is also the word Democrat or from the word Democrat. And that makes democracy exclusive to the left. And that is my fear, is that maybe, you know, people need to change up the names of these parties, because you could argue that really Democrats should be called constitutional Republicans or Democratic Republicans because they care for the Republic and they care for the for the vote. But Republicans are not Republican and they're certainly not conservative. So isn't this part of the problem in the US where, you know, people are very literal and they do like to compartmentalize? And actually, if we switch the names of the parties, then people might find that they've been sitting in the wrong place for the last few years. I think I think labels are dangerous and 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 problematic across the board. I, I mean, I you know, we we describe Courier as a progressive news organization simply because our values have been defined that way. And I really struggle with that because we are not a partisan organization by any means. But uh, that but you're is also not progressive, Tara. You're not in America. You are. Right. But in the rest of no, the world, none America, of your values are progressive. But even in America, just they're normal. not. <laughs> they right. are popular. Um, yeah. But it's true. We, we, they, we, have, uh, we have really ceded the definition of these terms to the right. And I do believe because of, 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 uh, of Donald Trump more than anyone else, um, he has polarized the word democracy. He has made democracy a partisan word um, because only one party fighting for democracy yeah. and him and him with the big lie and that kind of having this downstream effect in, in the MAGA Republican Party is a problem because we have to remind people, I mean, just this week, Republicans in the House put a vote up about supporting socialism mm. or not to try to get Democrats mm. to vote whether or not they support socialism like this is theater and it's the worst kind it's not good theater it's it's just they are doing they are playing an information war playbook that they have done for a long period of time and it is scary because we do have to remind people what democracy is and how much they want it how much they benefit from it and how important it is that we protect and i do think we saw that a bit in the in the midterms in 2022, I think people did come out for democracy. I think abortion was the defining issue by and large. But I do think seeing the overreach and seeing all of the election deniers and denialism, I don't think that sits well with a lot of people in this country, um, uh, especially people who remember the stories of their uh, their the generations that came before them, then brought them here. Right. Like no one is just American in this country. That's the beauty of our country. We all came from other places at some point in time. And the reason this country exists is to protect religious freedom, to protect freedom and, and to have a, a capitalist society that enables opportunity for everyone. It's why so many people want to come to this country. But I do think that we have lost that civic literacy um, in large part because we have ceded that storytelling to the right. So, so let's talk about education, because there are plenty of MAGA Republicans collecting Social Security who are campaigning against socialism, and, and, and yet they are very much signed up to a socialist construct. Um, this has to start in school, doesn't it? We have to educate people from a young age to know that socialism is a, a function of, you know, the military is a socialist construct as well, as well as Medicare and Medicaid and, and Social Security, as I mentioned. We need these things. These are the backbone of supporting people who have often paid into the system. You know, this is actually the money that people earned and, and often put in. H how do we start with young people? I mean, I have very young children, and my seven-year-old daughter told me the other day that she has to do the Pledge of Allegiance in school every morning. And I didn't know this because, you know, I'm a, a useless parent I do my best but you know I just didn't know I just didn't I'd never been to a US school I and I was like do you want to sing that because she's British my daughter and and she was she was like yeah I mean I don't mind and I said well you do whatever you want to do if you feel like it's right for you but they're doing black history month and they're doing you know but then again I live in California so there are different things going on all around the world all all around the country all I would say is I have no idea what my kids should be learning in school. I want a school board. I want educators. I want experts to decide. So it's not about me choosing. And yet we see 
parents campaigning in Florida to get books off of shelves because they think they contain critical race theory. And they seem to think that they are smarter than those who are trained to educate their children. I mean, I'll I'll hand this ball over to you because I don't really know where to start with any of this. It's it's difficult to know where to start because the attack on education in America is happening at so many levels driven by the right. And this, again, gets to the polarization and the divided country that we really do live in. If you have a Republican governor, you have a Republican-led statehouse in this country, they are banning books. They are uh, affecting uh, what they are. They are making decisions, profound decisions that will have profound implications on what children are taught and what they are not taught. Um, and and also there is a new, not new, but um, there is an increasingly popular wave of attacks at public schools in general through school vouchers for private schools. We just saw this in Iowa, our Iowa newsroom, Iowa starting line has covered this debate um, and session in the Iowa State House and the bill passed because it's Republican. In the middle led. of the night, right? Yeah. And it, it, yes. And it's I mean, it's. The, the no one in Iowa was requesting this. No families in Iowa. Public schools are the heart of communities in rural America yeah. and in states like Iowa. Um, and it's coming with dark money from outside, from coastal billionaires and elites who who have an agenda to promote private schools that they will financially benefit from. That's the, the short story. And 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 this is yet being exported to all states that are run by Republicans again to attack public schools so they can control the education and frankly, brainwashing of younger generations. And so it is incredibly important that we do everything we can to protect and bolster and strengthen public education in this country, not not eliminate it, which is their end goal. Um, and, And that there is again, regulation. So people, so have a fair shot of being educated with the truth, what's gonna happen and what is I believe the Republicans intention is that Every child that grows up in a state that is Republican led is going to have an entirely different conception as we see older people who watch Fox News versus who get good information that is factual, where there will be the divisions will only increase because they will have entirely different educations and understandings. And indoctrination at a very young age is very dangerous. And we've seen that in religion and we've seen that with cults and we've seen that with you know, organizations that are wholly unsavory. And and so how do we, because my view is that we're going to end up with state warfare, where, where, as you described, different states will end up being entirely Republican or entirely Democrat. People will, over time, start to kind of move. And there has been a bit of a shift of people, you know, relocating across the country to be with like-minded people. I mean, if your parents think a certain way and you have young children then you are going to indoctrinate them and you'll end up with this thing called hereditary voting where your parent, you know, my parents voted conservative. So I voted conservative when I, when I was mm-hmm. 18 first chance. And so, you know, th- that in itself is unfair to children, isn't it? But also lying to them about, you know, revisionist history is also not healthy either. No, it's not. And parents are busy. Most parents have one, two, three jobs in this country, right? To keep food on the table and to and to give their kids good opportunities and a good life. And so it is not their job to your earlier point, nor should it be to also determine what is taught or what is not taught in schools. I think a lot of parents don't have the time to think about that. And so they're just they're not also going to fight it. Right. They're they're They might not even be aware if we don't make them aware of what's happening and changing in their school systems. Um, but that is the point. That is their goal is to indoctrinate from a young age as opposed to provide a good education. Right. The same thing we see play out in media is what's now happening in school systems and school boards um, and state houses when it comes to education. And it's it's it is terrifying. I will say it's I don't have children. I struggle with the idea of having children in this country um, because of all of these different things. But I, I really do think that the attention paid on education is important because, again, they are weaponizing parents' emotions. They are riling up parents' emotions. We're seeing this also on the insane attacks on trans individuals in this country in state houses that are led by Republicans um, and school boards uh, where, you know, they are are trying to prevent people from being who they are in this country and, and villainizing and shaming and inciting violence against populations. 
So it's it, it, there is not a lot of good that is coming out of Republicans gaining power where they gain power in this country. And the education piece is so important that we are getting those stories out and that they're coming from messengers that are trusted, that aren't just partisan media outlets or 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 progressive or Frankly, politicians are not good messengers on this stuff for most people. So we just I don't even more. hear people debunking the CRT argument. I mean, Marjorie Taylor Greene actually said it out loud in Congress a few days ago, didn't she? She had to explain to somebody who was on the stand, you know, what CRT was. And she said, you know, it's a racist ideology that's being taught in all schools, which is completely untrue. You know, it's a module in very few select universities that is very difficult for people that want to go there. And I believe but, in not one public school in this country could find yeah. any evidence of CRT ever being ever being taught. But maybe we should talk about CRT just for a second, because what they are actually describing is a conversation about African-Americans or trying to in some way make sure that the conversations are a little more inclusive, which teachers, I hope, are all doing, that, that the people are not excluded in class, because it would be foolish to think that there is no discussion of race in class. And even in my daughter's class, she's in first grade, that she is coming home and having conversations with me about understanding where everybody fits in society. That they're, they're effectively using the, the kind of acronym CRT, they're purposely using it because there is no conversation about the detail of what is going on in schools and what should be going on in schools. And so there are teachers now in Republican states that are scared of being prosecuted and so removing all the books from the shelves until they've been looked at by a, what do they call them, like a media analyst or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is this is a mess because the reality is that they're just seeking everybody in class to be white and Christian. That's their dream. But America doesn't look like that. So this is going to end in tears, isn't it? Yeah, it's not going to end well. Um, it's it, it's truly not. And, uh, you know, you just think about the strain that's already put on our teachers in this country. Uh, less people than ever before want to go into teaching. Um, it's not a fun job, as we've seen over the past number of years. Um, they're not paid nearly well enough to be helping raise the next generation of Americans in this country. And then they are and then they are uh, put in these terrible positions where they are scared of losing their job to your point, are scared of being charged with a felony simply by reading a book that they have taught in their curriculum for 20 years that is entirely based on factual historical information. Um, it, this is uh, this is a war on our schools and our future generations by the right uh, to indoctrinate them to their incredibly dangerous ideals. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the way that I have always come to understand how to fight back in this war is with your vote. It is it, we still do have a democracy. And like I said before, I hope that we keep it. But we have to know what these people really stand for. I had a I was at a Bruce Springsteen concert. I was very lucky this past week for my birthday. And uh, I, I was talking to this um, this older gentleman when I was eating dinner alone. And we got into a conversation. And he was from New Jersey, but we were in Florida for the concert. And uh, and politics came up, as it tends to do with me. And uh, he said, I'm not, I'm not a Trumper, though. I'm not a Trumper. I was like, OK. And he said, but I love that guy, Ron DeSantis. And I was like, you love that guy who just banned African-American history from schools in Florida? And he said, I never heard that. Where did you get that information? Mm. And I showed him a bunch of news articles. And I said, where do you get your information? And he was not a Fox News watcher, but the circles that he runs in, the social media that he's on have glorified, Ron, right? Like he is living in an echo chamber where Ron DeSantis is this machismo hero and he it wasn't that he agreed that you should ban african americans history because he didn't he'd never heard that right that isn't the information about ron DeSantis yeah. that is reaching people that could be supportive of him and so again it, it just kind of goes back again to how we get factual information out i do believe the majority i believe in the american people and i believe that they don't stand with these extremists on these issues but if they don't know about these positions or these laws that are being passed in Republican-led states, and they're only hearing good things about these people through right-wing media or their personal networks, then this is how we, we, we are on a race to the bottom. Bruce Springsteen actually has a lot to say about this stuff, doesn't he? You know, he's somebody who's just been singing for years, and 
He has a, a podcast with Barack Obama called Renegade, which I've really enjoyed. And you really get to hear somebody who you could argue is that kind of all-American with his, with his, you know, Fender guitar and he really gets it. You know, he really understands. And I do like this notion of, of musicians. I mean, this is another way to reach people, isn't it? And Springsteen is a perfect example of somebody who can probably reach across the aisle. Born in the USA is a very patriotic song, right? And he's doing his best. Maybe he should have picked someone other than Obama to do a, to do a, a yeah. podcast. With. Actually, that's where I give him a great deal of credit because I think too many celebrities are actually too scared about losing their fan right. base by becoming more political. But yeah. uh, it, it, no one was more supportive than Barack Obama or uh, Democratic candidates for years than Bruce Springsteen. He, he is unapologetic and he comes out with those things and he hasn't lost his Republican fan base because yeah. they love his music. They might hate his politics, but that does make him a really strong and trusted messenger. And also, again, I just I really, really applaud uh, his his willingness to do that with his superstardom, because I think if more people did, uh, it would become more normalized for folks that these are not progressive values. These are popular values or positions Uh, and what and what the right is proposing in this country and what they are espousing and standing for are extremely unpopular and extremist. And we just have to make sure that Americans know the difference. I just want to uh, make a final reference to the, a story that came out um, this week of uh, the Associated Press got an exclusive audio clip from a senior member of Donald Trump's re-election campaign, said that uh, campaigners were going to fan the flame and spread the false claim that Democrats were trying to steal this election, referring to November 2020. Um, I mean, this is, you know, not that we needed proof to know that the whole, uh, you know, election fraud thing was a ho- was a, you know, the concept of it was a hoax by the right. But now there is even members of Donald Trump's former campaign staff who who anonymously, because they obviously fear, uh, you know, being attacked personally, are leaking these tapes. I mean, if this is not an example of the right's kind of base crumbling. Because there's a lot of talk about Donald Trump being now rejected by the right and how 2024 could actually look very different in terms of candidates to what we think. It could end up being Nikki Haley versus Hakeem Jeffries. I mean, who knows, right? It is um, It is incredibly uh, helpful and valuable and important when they say the quiet part out loud. Yeah. And I think that we are seeing that more and more. And to your point about this being leaked from someone, we're about to enter what I imagine will be an incredibly uh, uh, crowded, complicated, and entertaining Republican primary in this country. Um, it's been slow to start, which has been interesting, but it certainly will speed up. Um, and 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 that provides a lot of opportunity for a lot of information to come from trusted messengers to Republicans in this country from other Republicans about the extremist ones. I I hope uh, that they can beat them. (laughs) We saw that in some uh, races, right? They have a real primary problem, and it's going to be really interesting to see how the party navigates it on the right. But I think that it is very beneficial when they increasingly feel comfortable saying the quiet part out loud, uh, that they are lying, that they have an agenda, um, and that they are willing to uh, do anything uh, in their power, legal or not, to protect and advance that agenda. And as long as we uh, make sure that that stuff does not get lost in the noise and that it comes through and it's reinforced, then I, I, I again, believe in the American people's judgment um, uh, when they go to the ballot box. Okay. Thank you, Tara, uh, seriously, for your for your time and also your crusade and your campaign. Uh, and I wish you all the best with Courier Newsroom. Thank you so much, Anthony. It was a pleasure. I'm Anthony Davis. Please subscribe to The Weekend Show on YouTube or as an audio podcast and also the 5-Minute News daily podcast, which drops every morning so you can hear me tell you what's happening around the world while you make your morning coffee. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch. Midas Touch.